It's my honor to welcome the first Art History of Games Symposium. We're so grateful that the Woodruff Art Center and the High Museum have provided us this wonderful facility to use. And to our sponsors and patrons who genero whose generosity made this first ever conference of its type possible. You know, I was thinking about this welcome to SCAB, but also our, our Georgia Tech students and others that are here. And actually, SCAD and Georgia Tech has quite a bit in common, maybe more than you might imagine. Well, for example, our mascots. Surprisingly alike. We have the SCAD B and the Tech Yellow Jacket, so we do have a lot in common, that's for sure. You know, this three-day public symposium organized by SCAD Atlanta and the Georgia Inst Institute of Digital Media Programs is part of a continuing collaboration between our two insti institutions in game design, game development, and game studies. The Art History of Games Conference is our ma first major opportunity to bring these expertise together to studies art and history and related cultural studies to explore the importance of game development at an, in an art form. The symposium also draws attention to Atlanta as an important center for fine arts and scholarship in the field of game studies. Two of the leading artists and many of the leading artists and scholars in the gaming industry who will be speaking during the conference, thank you very much for being here and your contributions to this historic symposium. We look forward to your presentations and I know our students are very excited with the opportunity to interact with you. I also want to thank the creators of the three newly commissioned games that are currently on display just down Peachtree Street at the Colleen Art Gallery. And you'll be hearing a lot more about these newly commissioned games during the, this evening. And lastly, perhaps most important, I want to acknowledge the committee and the dedicated individuals that put this event on. A great deal of time and energy has gone into organizing this conference. And I'd especially like to thank uh, our Associate Dean of Film and Digital Media, Matt Maloney, SCAD Professor of Interactive De Design and Game Development, John Sharp, and Georgia Tech Professors Ian Bogus and Michael Nitsche. We greatly appreciate this conference and all of you participating in it and the educational, as an educational and enjoyable symposium. And as you break new ground, unearth the past, and pay homage to the next generation of games and game development. Next up will be Kenneth Kennespell, the Dean of Liberal Arts for Georgia Tech. Ken? Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Kenneth Knespel, and it is my pleasure as chair and uh, dean, really, uh, at Georgia Tech. It's been my pleasure to follow the development and, indeed, in part, participate in the hard work that has gone into making it possible for us to be here this evening. I want to recognize the numerous support that has been received for the conference. In addition to SCAD and Georgia Tech and the Woodruff Art Museum, you can see in your program that many companies, many individuals have supported our being able to be together this evening. Given the economic stress that we're all very well aware of, the support that we receive from these companies, these industries, from these very generous individuals is enormously important. At the platinum level, you will see in the program we have support, I would say not surprisingly, from Caneva. At the gold level, Entertainment Software Association and the Georgia Tech Research Institute, Kaylin Art, Molo, and W Atlanta Midtown. At the silver level, we have AT&T, BBMF Americas, uh, Georgia Film, Music, and Digital Entertainment, IndyCAD, GVU, Graphics Visualization and Usability at Georgia Tech, Pabst, Romero Archives, and Turner. The names of the individuals that have supported this in person, you will see as well in the program, Michael Bishop and Shane Thomas, VIP patrons, uh, Kevin Acosta, Javit Cordoba, Chris DeLeon, Oliver uh, Lejade, 
Richard Lamarchand, Mark Reggiano, and Deborah Thomas. These are among the people who we really want to thank for bringing us together this evening, making it possible for us to be here. Now, of course, as we've already heard, there are many other people that have made it possible for us to be here, and uh, I want to particularly call attention to the work of Michael Nietzsche, Ian Bogus, John Sharp. Each of us will see in the coming days the diligence and the vision of their work. Our presence here this evening represents far more, however, than the bureaucratic meshwork of multiple institutions. It represents, together with similar events like this that are taking a place around the world, not only the cultural presence of digital games, but also the shifting boundaries of art and certainly what we mean by art history and the very concept of the art museum. The installations, exhibitions, presentations, and especially the discussions that we will have in the next days will challenge each of us to think about our roles in shaping what some will inevitably seek to classify in new visual configurations, new isms, if you want to think about it in this way, and sometimes I think almost new distorting isms, uh, that will appear in line with other things that we recognize, the old taxonomies of realism, expressionism, constructionism, all of those things. Our work here, however, must not stop at such superficial taxonomies. Instead, we are challenged to ask ourselves how our work in melding art and digital technology requires a new aesthetics and a new renewed consideration of what we mean by the art object. Our discussions in the coming days will serve as yeast in the emergence of such an aesthetic. I'm pleased to welcome you to this conference and to what surely will be a test kitchen, maybe a garage, for this new aesthetic. Welcome all and thank you. Pardon us for a minute while we do a little switching. So, hi all, welcome, uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm John Sharp, Professor of Interactive Design and Game Development at SCAD Atlanta. Uh, and I'm Ian Bogus, Professor at Georgia Tech. And my name is Michael Nitsch, also Professor at Georgia Tech. So what we're gonna do for about a half hour is tell you why we drug you all to Atlanta for the next three days, or <laughs> at least we're gonna try to do that. Uh, but before we start, we thought we'd share a little anecdote with you. The slide we have up on the screen here. Uh, the three of us did a panel not so different than what we're about to do tonight back at SIGGRAPH in August. And because SIGGRAPH is you know, a lot of uh, serious uh, egghead programmers and mathematicians and that sort, we thought we ought to have some statistics in our presentation. Because everybody had. Statistics yeah, and was, numbers and right. formulas. So anyway, we made up this statistic and we put it up on the screen and we then saw this tweet. We, we, we really hope that whoever tweeted this is not in the room tonight so that we don't embarrass him or her further. But it was, it was interesting to see uh, how willing someone was to uh, accept that you know, something like art could be measurable and that, you know, down to the quarter percentage point and that this, this was a reasonable figure for uh, accounting for the amount of artiness that exists in games. So, so, so I immediately wanted to join the next myth and say that 31.7% of games are not art. 
Well, these numbers have changed since August, of course. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. We have yeah, to wait yeah. For, and you guys can purchase the research report at the desk up front. <laughs> so anyway, to get started, we want to give you a very quick little uh, nickel tour, if you will, of the next couple of days of what we'll be presenting to you all. Right. So, you know, tonight, what, really what we're going to do is introduce the event as we're doing, as we're doing right now, and then you're going to hear from uh, someone you may have heard of, a guy named John Romero, who has some experience in, uh, <laughs> in this medium and is going to give us, a, I think, a very different perspective than what you've maybe heard before from folks like him. Tomorrow morning, uh, we'll have, tomorrow is what we're calling the more academic day, or at least that's what I'm calling Don't it. Don't let that scare you away, no, though. Yes, no, no, academics are awesome. We, we are. We're, we're great people. Uh, in the morning, Frank Lance, Jesper Yule, and I. Wait, Frank's an academic? Oh, uh, well, yes, he is, actually. Yeah, I guess he, he is now. Hey, yes, yeah. he <laughs> How do you feel about that, Frank? Yeah, that we're right? sorry. Yeah. yeah, just keep, keep playing Vanitas there. Yeah. We're going to be, um, if you will, calibrating our ideas about uh, art and games a little bit. I'm going to be giving a very fast... Uh, kind of overview of the relationship between art history and games, or rather how games have been viewed by art and art history. And then Jesper is going to be talking about some sort of the ideal definitions that seem to float around these days uh, relating to games and game design. And then Frank's got some craziness that he's talking about where he, I think he's going to tell us that it's not games that need to change, but maybe it's art that needs to change in this equation. Ooh. Uh, after that, we continue our academic theme and continue with uh, J. David Bolter and Brian Schrank, who are both at the digital media program at Georgia Tech, and they talk about the two avant-garde of gaming and picking up this, this kind of motive of avant-garde and uh, directions of different situationist fluxes and data movements. Celia Pierce will con connect to that. and. Continue. Celia Pierce is also assistant professor at Georgia Tech, also in the digital media program. And finally, we will have Henry Lowood, who will concentrate much more on the player, talking about the player as the artist in the game uh, itself. So instead of the designer, he tries to shift the focus much more on the player, which is, I think, why, why academics are interesting in this context, because they actually look at the game and the player itself. They're not above the water. And then Saturday morning, the three commissioned games will be uh, the three artists, rather, that created commission games will the be games giving are talks. Not do, are no, the not games are not going to be speaking on Saturday no, morning. No, the games will not be speaking. It'll be the game makers speaking. Uh, and also, we have Brenda Brathwaite here, and she's going to be talking about some of her design work uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, we're going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I guess I'm up. Yes. Uh, <laughs> You're not, you're not really going through these, these no. slide references very well. No, we, have, we tried to print out very discreet little notes for ourselves. No. Uh, <laughs> no. We're going we're gonna to end uh, the day and the, the symposium with what you might think of as the, the flip side of the perspective we're starting with. So if we're beginning with, with John Romero, we're going to end with uh, Christian Paul from uh, the Whitney to talk about uh, games and art from the perspective of uh, the institutionalized uh, practice of, of art. I, you can take that word institutionalized, I guess, in any way you want. And then we party. Yes. Yeah. Here, why don't you flip through these? And I'm going to flip through these. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we did a tech check and all this. Yes, we did. So we're going to quickly, again, acknowledge our sponsors and patrons, our silver very sponsor, subtle. Keneva. Yes, very small and subtle. Our gold sponsors, ESA, the W, Molo Design, and uh, Kylan Art, and GTRI. Silver sponsors, there are many, I will not name them all, but thank you. And then the patrons, the individuals who cared enough about this event to make it happen, to give us money and support, we very much appreciate. So, finally, what is an art history of games? I, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the idea of, the, of this, this whole symposium and the question behind it, um, I think, has to be justified, and it's interesting that we have to justify the question in the first place. So rather than uh, lecture to you about uh, the 18 and a quarter percent of, of games that are art and kind of presenting our findings as if they were 
scientifically proven. Uh, what we want to share instead are a number of questions, uh, ways that you might answer um, this charge of developing in our history of games. Um, they may all be totally wrong. Uh, we may want to pick and choose between them. Um, there may be some that we've missed. There may be others that are more important. And um, we want to leave you with some of these questions that we hope you'll consider as you uh, listen to folks speaking over the next couple of days. So I think instead of asking the what we, the three of us, feel like is a kind of inane question, are games art? And hopefully you all agree with that. Or if you don't now, you will by the end of uh, Saturday. We'd rather look a little more closely, start the process of looking a little more closely, and think about where the relationships lie. What does it mean to really think about games as an art form? And so to start that, we're going to look at uh, some of the different um, perspectives that you could take, some of the, way, the vantage points you could take in trying to think about how games and art relate to each other. So the first of these, is the art of games found in the visual arts? This is certainly within the, you know, the, the tradition of art history. This is what art is about, right? The visual arts is what the history of art um, speaks to. And so what we can look here, and certainly there's something to be found in the, the visuals, the sensory elements. And it's interesting that this is the easiest access point. So if you talk about games and art, this is where industry very often sees the, the, the art element. That's what you hire an artist, and the artist will do visuals. That's kind of one perspective towards that. Right, and, and some of the shows that have existed that, that call themselves art and games together in some way are, are just uh, printouts, really, of screens or concept art from games, you put them on the wall and kind of turn them into art by extracting them from the works themselves. And then in other cases, uh, like if you, th if you think about a game like, like Bioshock here, the art is in borrowing trends and traditions. Uh, so you, t you take kind of art deco design and you throw it into your game uh, and you're, you're kind of appropriating uh, all of that, uh, that notion of art, that particular uh, style and rendering it visually. I think it also very much supports the kind of traditional approach of uh, the artist as author and the sort of passive consumption of art that certainly the previous 400 years supported very much, something that's broken down a little bit over the last century. So another place we can look is the art of games in their worlds. And where do these worlds end? So is the world of a video game what we see on the screen? Is it literally the, the rendered polygon masses that the PlayStation throws at us or the Xbox or whatever you use? Or is this game space, this play space that we talk about maybe extending beyond that? Is it the social space that Azeroth is in, in, inhabited by thousands and thousands of players forming the space as they are active in there? Or does it include the space in front of the television where you wiggle your Wii controller in order to play tennis. So the, the question what the game world is and, and where it ends itself is already open. I think it also lends itself to thinking about games sculpturally, right? Like you take the example of the, uh, the floor, hand, floor plan here. Um, that part of what game design is about is sculpting space and creating a space for your players to move through and navigate, at least in the sort of traditional um, first person point of view perspective that AAA titles are very much dominated by these days. Right, and another distinction between like architectural you know, diagrams or, or even 3D models and game spaces is that we, we normally expect to be able to move through these game spaces in real time. So there's something about the, the experience of these simulated worlds um, which may just involve you know, walking around in them and not doing anything else. So then we come to the technology. Is this where the art of games lies? So, you know, we can appreciate um, many games, maybe most games, if not all games, from a technical perspective and reflect on the mastery and expertise required to build systems upon which uh, games were made. So you can appreciate, you know, Doom for the experience it provides, or you can um, uh, reflect on the, the system that needed to be built in order to do real-time rendering of that kind. Um, and you know we can do that with with um, modern games, or we can do that with uh, older games. Like the the uh, screenshot from David Crane's Grand Prix is maybe doesn't look technically remarkable to us, um, 
but it, it is in some way because getting the cars to go off of the side of the screen without wrapping around on the other side, which is what the Atari wants to do, uh, requires all of this uh, uh, sort of incredible mastery and expertise in the, the technical um, uh, execution of the system itself. But I think this is also a vantage point that traditional art history can also relate to in some ways. You know, I remember when I was in grad school studying a Northern Renaissance, one of the sort of primary fields of study in that field is the technical examination of works of art, where people want to get little tiny chips of the paint and go and look at them in detail and figure out precisely what materials have been used to take uh, photographs with infrared and x-rays to be able to look through, see if we can find the underdrawing, to really understand the technologies that were used to create these paintings. And it can also lead to manipulation. So the example from Julian Oliver is a manipulation of the Quake render engine, which he abused. So he didn't recode it, but he changed it and, and played with a frame buffer, with a texture frame buffer, and then created completely new artifacts based on that. So sometimes that can also shift towards the user, to the, to the player, to the new artist creator when they use this, when they exploit these technologies. We could argue that um you know, technical virtuosity is maybe the primary way that the games industry and game fans talk about games as art. They may not use those words, but this is even how we, we tend to market games. You, know, you think about the Natal example, and it's not necessarily about the freedom and flexibility of the interface, or at least it's not only about that, but as much about the idea, of, look at this amazing new technology and what it can do. So does the art of games lie in the game design. And I think this is the place where traditional viewpoints of art may start to break down a little bit, or at least uh, scratch their heads. Because this isn't about, necessarily, the thing that's been created, but rather the response by the audience, the player, and you know, how they work within that. So it, it's both, you know, basketball is a great example that, you know, there's this wooden floor laid out in a gym of a very precise size with all these lines painted on it. It's a fairly abstract system, but within that, the experience it provides is, can be quite magical. Right, and we, and we, you know, if we reflect on the kind of architectural notion of art, you can't simply point to the, uh, the court mm -hmm. and say that that is, that is basketball. There is, you know, the system of behaviors that are regulated, and you can't put that in a box or put it in a frame around it and put it in the wall, which uh, makes it m more difficult. It resists uh, traditional ways of, of displaying and uh, <laughs> preserving art. Mm -hmm. Which kind of touches on the problem that we have when we talk about the art history of games, because there might be an art history of play that might be different or connected, obviously, to that. And if the game design is made for the, for the player then to exploit as in an amazing basketball game, um, then there is something happened that is based on the design but extends from this, which I think is already where we go. I think the, uh, the other three examples here are all very specifically lo-fi in terms of the, uh, the sensory elements, particularly Jason's game and Rod's games, that they're taking a stance that games are not about what they look like necessarily, or at least trying to take the position that there are many different ways that games can look and that it doesn't have to be about uh, reproducing the visual world the visible world as accurately and faithfully as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, R R Rod Humble's piece here, a, a game called The Marriage, which if you're, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of this allegorical game about marriage, which only reads as being about marriage because it's called The Marriage. Uh, in, in some ways, it's almost conceptual. It's like a, a game that is mounting this position itself, saying, well, you know, really what, where the art is in games is in their design. Like, what if we stripped everything else away and simply left that remainder? And then, of course, with, uh, with something like Wii Tennis, or you could replace this with other versions of, um, of sports games, we begin seeing the, the, the trouble when you, when you try to translate or adapt uh, familiar games into other forms. What makes Wii Sports Tennis different from real tennis? And if we wanted to treat one as uh, uh, an art form be based on its design principles, based on the rules of the game, how would we distinguish between the two? And a logical progression from there is the art of games found in player performance. And I think this is, can definitely become a sticking point for a lot of people. Because um, that suggests co-authorship at best. 
and even that the you know the real power lies with the player and not with the designer and I think that very much um, questions a lot of our foundations about art well there has been uh, the the interest in participatory art is growing and uh, there has been a movement into this but I think games can contribute their own perspective and their own strong area and contribute to this quite profoundly if we embrace this perspective if we think that uh, the art actually happens in the process of playing that's what's the, what I kind of pointed out at this a second ago where we have the history of games the history of play if we realize the art in our interaction with the artifact then I obviously have to look at the artist in front of the, the screen and the artist in the the doom god or the the soul calibur dancers or the halo dancers that they that they used to perform which really shifts the perspective here where art happens and and how art happens i think uh, the ali fraser fight is a it's i think it's a bit jarring for a lot of people to think that you might find beauty in something like a boxing match but if you're kind of tuned in to the the essence of the sport, you know, the sweet science, as some people call it, um, there can be great beauty in there. I think what tends to happen with um, the sort of popular perception of what games do to people is kind of encapsulated in these two photographs of the kids, the uh, Robbie Cooper photos, that people suspect perhaps games are damaging our children, that they're turning them into these zombies, you know, like like these uh, children from the New York Times. I think was this the one in the Times. Yeah, yeah. So, so what the artist does is, I mean, if it's not clear, it takes these photographs, there's this rig that's set up to, to photograph players while they're playing video games, and you're seeing the view kind of from the screen out. So, you know, there's also this kind of nesting that, that's mm -hmm. happened here where the, the, you could take these photographs and, and put them on a wall in a gallery and, and treat that as art, but there's this, this entire apparatus that was necessary to produce uh, those, uh, those expressions in the first place the Pac-Man screen. This is the very last level in Pac-Man. Has anybody in here ever actually played and gotten to this? You can emulate, so you can cheat nowadays. But this is, this demonstrates mastery, player mastery, that a player managed to get to the, is it 256 yeah, yeah. level? So the, the integer rolls over and the game breaks essentially, and you can still try to play it. It's, it's not, not very easy to see what's going on anymore. But of course, you have to play through 256 screens of Pac-Man uh, to get here, which maybe isn't something that you want to watch someone do in the same way that you would watch a, I don't know, a, a, a music, musical theater or something, you know. Uh, but indeed, you know, that performance that's required to, uh, uh, to produce this end result is in, in some ways remarkable. And uh, if you've watched uh, some of the documentaries that have been made in the past few years about competitive, competitive gaming, um, you can see that there's there's something um, art-like or or maybe even athletic in this practice. Ah. So a, a slight change of tack. So we've looked a little bit at the different ways we can maybe think about games as an art form, and now looking at some of the issues relating to uh, kind of their the historical response to games. So one of them being how games have been treated as historical artifacts. Yeah. You don't tend to find them with great frequency in art museums. If you're going to find them in a museum, likely it's going to be more an institution dealing with cultural history or perhaps technological history. Yeah. One of, if you've ever been to the British Museum, the British Museum is a wonderful place filled with all of these amazing artifacts that the British plundered from the four corners of the world over the centuries. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one, one of them, I mean, this is maybe something local, but the, the, the Lewis chess set, um, it's, it's really amazing uh, uh, sculptural chess set. And you can buy copies of this and play with it. But it, it struck me when I was in the British Museum a couple of years ago that this is the only thing that's in that entire place that when you buy it at the gift shop, you can actually use it in, in the same way that it would have been used uh, as a real artifact. You know, in, it's, it's not simply that you're buying a bookmark with a picture of it on it. Uh, but you can you can obtain this this chess, and of course it, it doesn't change the way that chess is played. Um, but you're connecting with uh, this lineage uh, through which it it evolved, and the same is sort of true of a game like Senate. So same thing. I was in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo uh, last year, and they're just 
I don't know, like thousands maybe of, of Senate uh, sets, and no one knows how to play Senate. Uh, it's been totally lost to history, but the artifact is represented as evidence that, you know, oh, there's this game, and it seems like it, it falls into this sort of backgammon -y lineage. We don't really, we can try to make guesses about it, uh, but it, it's almost evidentiary in that way. It, it almost has got the reference to an, to an religious artifact. So it could be um, an, an item used in some holy ceremony. And that might be play, that might be a game, or it might be something, something different, if there is something different. But, but I think there's definitely something, there's something there to think about and explore with why we don't know how to play this game, right? The, the sort of ephemeral nature of games historically, that it wasn't deemed something perhaps that we, you know, was worth. I mean, you can, you can read the, Egyp the Egyptian yes. Book of the Dead, for example. But yes, yeah. we could. Yeah. We won't do that right now. And then the final example over here, this crazy image of a um, Chinese warrior who's been shot with a poison arrow. And so the surgeons are working on him at the moment. It wasn't through his heart, was it? No, it was okay. through his arm. And while the surgeons are extracting the poison, he's busy playing a game of Go. And everybody else in the room is freaking out at the blood spilling everywhere. You see the one guy over there catching the blood in a platter. But the only person who's kind of focused is the man having surgery performed on him. The, the game of Go was you know, one, there's a lot of things about Go that relate to the kind of shogun and uh, warrior mindset. But it's a very interesting image. I think a lot of our historic understanding of games often comes from representational art. So there's a paradox there in some ways for this conference that the way we sometimes learn about the meaning and the use of these games coming through the lens of paintings and other works of art. So how games relate to the traditions of the art world. And, and here my favorite is the E.T. dump, basically. So, so when they don't fit, they get buried and might be the, the time capsule that will be digged out by some aliens in, in 100 or 200 years. So, but, but what's really interesting is that they become part of our cultural landscape even when they're underground. <laughs> so so the, the image, the, the kind of slightly brownish ones below this, it's a screenshot from a, from a music video from a, from a band that does the film about, the, the videos about them digging out these, uh, these artifacts, these, these historical artifacts, and discovering them and playing them again. So this, this dead game, this, this game that has been lost in the desert, suddenly comes to life in other cultural artifacts, and they seem to, to spawn and, and, and spread into different art forms. You can bury games, but you can't kill them. Yeah, you can't run. Kind of hide. So I think uh, the kind of comparison of Cory Archangel's Super Mario Clouds and Mark Essen's Fly Wrench is interesting. That kind of traditionally, when games in the last 20, 30 years have been embraced by the, you know, the galleries, museums, they have to give up a certain amount of their gameness. So for those of you who don't know Super Mario Clouds, Cory Archangel took a uh, Super Mario Brothers cart and hacked it so that the only thing left on the cart were the sky and the clouds. And so he basically um, neuters the game and, and turns it right. into a piece of conceptual art. Yeah. yeah, and then of course, you know, it's possible to run it like video, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a, a mode of, of exhibition that galleries and museums know how to, know how to deal with. They know, very well know how to deal with it. But then you take uh, like Essen's Fly Wrench, which was part of the Younger Than Jesus exhibition up in New York this past spring, and it, it was a real anomaly in the in the show. I I felt like it you know it was kind of tucked away in a little corner. Its physical presence felt very minimal and not necessarily in a good way. It just it felt awkward and gangly within that exhibition space. It, it wasn't comfortable there. At least that's how it felt to me. Mm -hmm. And then you take a uh, work like uh, Brenda Brathwaite's Train, which within the game community has received great critical praise and some critical, critical, critical criticism, we'll say. <laughs> but anyway, it's been interesting speaking with Brenda over the last year or so, and you know, she's trying to negotiate with a gallery or a museum 
about exhibiting the game, and it always becomes this moment in the conversations, it seems, that the gallerists become uncomfortable about the idea of people being able to walk up and interact with the game at just any point, that scheduled times have to be arranged when it's okay for the game to be activated. And then the rest of the time, it just needs to sit there and look like a sculpture and have guards protecting it. Just, it's, it's kind of strange. But, but we are not scared, so please come to the Kylan Arts exhibit and play it because it's going to be out there and, and ready yeah, to tomorrow, play. Yeah, tomorrow night you'll be able to tomorrow, play. Tomorrow, yeah. So, the problems the marketplace creates for games as art. I think Ian has a nice little story for us. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, there's this, this sort of difficulty in taking, taking games that you want to construe as art and then commercializing them in a fashion that's different from games as commodities. So, like, when I make these weird Atari games and then I make ten of them or something and try to turn them into, uh, you know, kind of artifacts that, uh, uh, that exist in, in, on a different plane in, in some ways from the ordinary video games that people would think to buy, then uh, we end up with you know very strong negative reactions to the idea. That, like, why would I why would I spend money on, on something like this, or uh, why would I spend more than the twenty dollars that it, it it would have cost in 1983 to buy an Atari cartridge? Um, and you know, and then I tried to port my game to the iPhone um, and sell it for you know 99 cents or whatever, and people still bitch that it's like, it that's shouldn't cost 99 cents because you know it's, it's way too expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so realistic. you know the, the there's this there's this problem of of being a working artist you might say in in games you can be a a, a professional game developer and work for a company if you struggle really do, you know and you try to be an independent game developer and you work through the channels that exist for uh, for indie games uh, in the way that like John Blow did for for Braid with with Xbox Live and, and now with PSN and these downloadable channels then uh, you know that is the way that normal games are consumed and you know is it desirable to make your art games uh, to force them to exist in those channels? Are there reasons why you might want to reject them? Do you want to just give them away? Uh, Jason uh, gives away all these games, actually, in, in that you can always compile them from source. Uh, Passage was given away first and, and later, um, again, ported to the iPhone. So, or, or a game like, a, a thing like Super Mario Clouds, which is sort of a game, or, or could exist in, in a form like a game, ends up being sold um, as video, as digital video on uh, on tape, and that's how the that's how the the agents deal it essentially. Mm -hmm. well, it's, you know, if you you speak with Corey or Michael Smith or any of the artists that have created video games, and you ask them about this sort of thing, you just, just it always starts with a, <sighs> a this sigh, and then they start talking about the real challenges and what just shouldn't seem that difficult, but trying to get their product out there because it's not on a DVD or a videotape. But, but maybe there are actually the same kind of constraints that we praise when we talk about design that might be relevant also when you talk about the marketing. So I'm not marketing any games. I can't talk from first-hand experience, but maybe these kind of constraints shape what we get and shape where we go too. So maybe it's not all just an, a limitation. Maybe it is a channel through which they go or through which they get formed. The question is what kind of channel that. So with that, I think, really, there's a big question that hovers over the next three days. Why is it important to be having this conversation? This is something that uh, we, you know, if we knew the answer, we probably wouldn't have organized the symposium. We'd have just written a nice book or something and published that's it. That's what I would have done. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely <laughs> what Ian would, have, Ian would have done. Well, you know, and, and maybe it's not. I mean, one answer is this is just bollocks, and really we should we should move on and do other things. Um, and I think that the kind of perspective that we want to start this symposium off with is that of openness to uh, these perspectives or others. Uh, if we ex if we don't explore the question seriously, though, if we simply ask the the dumb question, "Are games art? Yes or no?" Um, then we don't necessarily make any progress. There'll be a little questionnaire you fill out as you walk out on Saturday with that question. Two boxes. Yeah, two boxes. I guess. Yes, I know. So well, I think at this point what we'd like to do is open up for 10, 15 minutes of questions with you all before we uh, have John come up and give his talk. So, so maybe we missed some 
key questions that, yes. that, that are burning in your. There are mics on either side yeah. of the room that I believe are live. So come on up. Uh oh. Oh dear. Jason. Uh, can you go back like three or four slides? There was one picture you didn't talk about and I didn't. Oh, down there, be oh, down there below Mario Clouds. What's that? that? This one, okay. There's actually several pictures we forgot to talk about. But this one, I think, is Ian kind of made this point early on that this is the way games, this is the way a traditional exhibition of visual arts wants to happen. That the games aren't played, they're sort of turned into just the ephemera, the, you know, the static objects that we passively look at and appreciate. Right. And this is even true in the traditional, uh, the games community, not just the traditional art community. Uh, I've been several times to the uh, Classic Gaming Expo, which is the kind of event that you can imagine. And <laughs> they have this museum that they, that they set up, and they bring in all this wonderful stuff, and people have these amazing collections. It's like Vectrex games and, and other things that, that are hard to find. But um, they put on this, this uh, kind of art world uh, frame around it. You, know, you can't touch anything, and you're, you're really just meant to look at it and admire that it existed once. Which is like like vintage uh, uh, collectors from, from albums or LPs, right? So they put them into their protective hulls and then they're never ever to be played ever again because if you play them, you destroy them. They're but not mint anymore. No. Yes. It's, it's a game pieces, it's some board games, it's some um, like... Right, and some like print pieces relating to games and then images of things relating to games. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm wondering for your thoughts on what are some of the limitations of trying to shoehorn games into the framework of art, and in particular some of the, the language and way we think about games in terms of ideas like play that have trouble fitting in with that art. And in particular, I'm thinking of uh, Ralph Koster's work, uh, A Theory of Fun for Game Design. And Koster's idea of fun seems like such a useful way to try to come up with a, a, a term that can help explain what it is that gives us pleasure and satisfaction out of games. And I'm wondering then how you transfer terms like fun and play to the world of art without seeming to sort of apologize for exactly what makes games games as opposed to some other medium. Okay, right. So, you know, fun is not necessarily something that the traditional art world wants to encourage. <laughs> You're supposed to go and like be very stern, and, and you wear a turtleneck, and you need to climb, and, and you know it's a high cultural affair uh, that's not meant to be brought down to the level of uh, the sort of ribaldry of, of pop culture. But but yet at the same time, we've seen a lot of pop culture make way into the fine arts world or the the, the exhibition world, the museums, and, mm -hmm. and so forth over the past ten or fifteen years. And they they seem they seem not to have that problem. So there was this. What's this exhibit? It's in LA, I think, the Masters of the Universe uh, mm -hmm. exhibit, which is all He Man uh, yeah. inspired, right? Yeah. Well, I think an interesting was the, uh, the MoMA back in, I think, 90, put on the High Low exhibition, which is this, you know, bringing out the juxtapositions of how low culture has trickled up and informed high culture. And there's an area game to be found. But I also think this is this is uh, something that, that Frank and, and probably others are going to try to address um, over the next few days. That mm -hmm. you know, if, if we're if we're assuming that really what we want is to stop slumming in the game world and move up, you know, into the the, the art world, then that might not be the right perspective to take. Maybe so, in fact we want to invert that. So I also think that the, the principle of fun and, and Costa's idea, if I'm not completely, if I remember correctly, is like. Recognition, right? You recognize things, and because you recognize things, you, you are engaged, you get more and more engaged because you recognize more and more things. But sometimes art should should throw you off, right? So it shouldn't always be recognizable on, on the first immediate give me pleasure level. So, so I'm not quite sure that this idea of fun is necessarily an idea of art. Might be, I'm not sure, but if I recall it correctly, it would be like a constant reaffirmation. Sometimes Art and games as art might not reaffirm constantly, which train might be a good example for. I guess just to follow up, I guess what what I'm thinking of is um, uh, 
Uh, in science fiction, as it moved into the academy in the 60s and 70s, one rallying cry for some science fiction fans was keep science fiction in the gutter where it belongs. This fear that by moving science fiction, getting canonized and embraced by the academy, that in the process you have to distort and apologize for exactly what made science fiction vital. And it's, it seems to me, even in some of your examples of something like Super Mario Clouds, that seems very much what happened. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how you, uh, how you avoid that happening, or if there's a value to you know, like rejecting art as a goal for what a yeah. good game should be. Right. I mean, one perspective we could take is that art is is broken as a concept, <laughs> and we can't really even use it anymore. That the the 20th century, the kind of the avant-garde traditions of the 20th century, destroy our notions of art permanently, and we might as well just move on to something else. Uh, that's that's one perspective. I know that um, uh, Jay and, and Brian are going to talk about some of these avant-gardist positions, although I don't want to uh, assume that that's the perspective that they're going to take. But you know, it is a, a valid way to look at things, that this, the problem is not that games are in art, the problem is in assuming that art exists. And we don't, we, maybe we shouldn't apologize, so maybe we just do it and we don't apologize. Right. Do it first, apologize later. So uh, a lot of the artifacts that traditional art has uh, uh, let's say inherited or pulled in, were at the time built for functional reasons, decorations, propaganda, uh, pottery. Uh, but meanwhile, if, if, it was, if it's there, it's invisible to me, um, are video game technologies that are not games in any sort of play sense um, being, are they within the art community? Are they, are they is the video games as art, um, does it basically, does it include any element of serious games that you guys have witnessed? You're asking if, if game systems have been sort of appropriated by the art community, essentially. So uh, the, um, the political games and those sorts of things, if, they are, if the art community looks at those the same way it looks at Braid, or the same way it looks at um, or can discuss things like Train as an artifact of uh, valid art as opposed to just served a function. I suppose I should know the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my, my sense is no, not really. I mean, that's my, my sort of feeling is that this is kind of a one-sided conversation, is what it feels like. I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I think there's a lot more energy put into this from the game side than there's put into it from the art side. Um, yeah, I mean, I've talked to people, for example, about some of my you know, so-called political games, and, and then when they find out that they're games, it's what John was talking about earlier, like, well, what do we, if we were going to artify them, what would we do to them? Well, you know, they're, I don't know. They're, <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't really meant to be, to be treated in that fashion. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, even with film, there is a, a natural way of creating experiences around it that you can have sort of communal conversation with. You can screen a film, and then you, know, you can talk about it after, as, as film festivals tend to do. And uh, I remember back when the Slam Dance Game Festival existed, uh, and you know, we, they tried to sort of set up we, uh, this, this sort of screening, we kind of talk about it, and it kind of worked, but also it kind of didn't because that screening experience doesn't, doesn't really exist for, for games, or at least not for, for all games. Well, I think if you, if you think about it from a purely infrastructural point of view of like, you know, the, for the MoMA or for the Hive, to be able to treat film as art requires this very um, you know, cost, costly, act of creating a theater and then setting up a schedule. It, it works completely differently, right? It took a while for museums to accept film. And then it took them a bit longer to create the support structures to actually um, display yeah. film. But I, I do wonder if had coin-op uh, lived, you know, and, and thrived beyond the early 80s, would that have developed into something, I mean, I don't even know what. To, would we have these sort of, these sort of hoity-toity arcades and you know you'd go in and you play these wacky games about you know crazy things. I mean, possibly maybe that would have been one direction. That's one kind of a dead dead line of games. Well, if you walk in the you know American Museum of the Moving Image, right, and the in their gallery of the games in there, right, and that it just always every time I walk in there, it just felt kind of weird to me. Like it was like. What, what are these game machines doing in this well, space? Like, it's not always weird. Like we have family logo here who did create exhibitions that do exactly that, right? They are they are doing this, but they they still pose a challenge to whoever wants to put it out there. Yeah. And I think one is literally 
I can't put it on the wall, so I have to create a new thing. Maybe I don't need a wall. I have to do something else. I have to have a projection screen suddenly. And they are not prepared for this yet. And the other problem might be that the, the question of reproducibility. It's the same with video art. Uh, how can video be art if everybody can have it? And, and they have got problems with dealing with that too. Like how do you market that, which brings all these things rolled up into one. So um, they don't know, and frankly, we don't know what we would like to look forward to discuss these problems. Okay, we take one more? Oh, yeah. yeah, we have, we have about five minutes. Um, as games develop this literature, we're developing a lot of auteurs. Uh, Jordan Mechner, Ueda, who all have their signature mark. But even if you're not including a writer in this, there's still a progression, there's still a narrative. Do you see games progressing as a narrative more theatrically, cinematically, or do we need to develop a more original language as we, you know, we decide between choice and linear games and such? Yeah, that's like a, that's a whole other conference. That'll be the uh, <laughs> the, the literature history of games. Uh, that, that's a, oh, we can do that. Yes. Next year. Or yeah. just stay till Sunday. <laughs> yeah, we'll stay till Sunday. <laughs> We're all here. But, yeah, but, but, uh, <laughs> it's raining out, so we'll find as well. Um, no, it's a, it's, for me, that that's another stumbling point for, in the same way, trying to legitimize yourself to art or to bend to be art, I feel like causes problems for games, and I feel like bending games to be a narrative form gets in the way, personally. That's my opinion. You know, but what, what the question points to as well is that there's, you know, there are probably going to be multiple ways of, of approaching this question, there's multiple styles. Yes. Um, and then, then we can argue about forms and styles and techniques rather than about this, this sort of big monolithic question mm -hmm. argument. Yeah, no, I well, and, and I would argue because I'm slightly a different position than John and Ian, I bet. Um, I think we're already there. We have already some some of these artifacts do that, but it's the same problem as with the with the museums. We don't recognize and and categorize and and realize that it's doing that. Some of these things do amazing things that have effects that we can't describe yet in a in a good way. And and they might be cinematic, they might be dramatic, they might be narrative but they are only evoked by this game. So I think some of them do this already. It's just we don't, we have to drip our head around this and, and try to understand and communicate that, which is a learning process. So I think it's not necessarily the, the game spending as, as, this, as John suggested. I think it's us actually realizing what we have and then building up on that. And I think we have already some things out there. Yeah. So one more question. Okay, yeah, as long as you want to take it. <laughs> um, so, I guess one of the things I'm wondering is whether or not um, this question about the art history of games is not connected to kind of the larger theoretical project of reevaluating games as kind of cultural, social, uh, textual, intellectual objects. And if this is, you know, this debate that we're having is just kind of a symptom of that larger problem that all three of you have already pointed to, that kind of we're trying to, in a way, uh, reconsider the game. And if that's true, as you've already pointed it, perhaps what we really need to be looking is for uh, new techniques of curation, new mechanisms of curation, new events, um, or maybe changing events that already exist that take on existing new media objects like the Ars Electronica conference to accommodate this kind of art form. Yeah, sure. I mean, the problem is that that is hard and you know, requires uh, a lot of arguing and possibly fist fights. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it takes it. You know, art didn't happen overnight, right? Art, as we know it, capital A art took you know, at least 150 years in early um, modern Europe to come about. So you know, it took a while. To get, we got to get critics in place. We got to get the people, artists, thinking in these terms and not thinking of themselves as craftsmen anymore. We've got to get people who pay us to do these things to start thinking about it as an art form. You know, there's so many attitudes and opinions and processes that have to change that it's going to take time. But there's also one thing that games in this process have, have speaking for them. I mean, they are, they are very, very attractive. People are very excited and, and playing games. Not necessarily the, well, probably they even play the, the complicated, difficult games. The ones that are not fun, but art. But uh, there, there is some, there's some interest in, in this media format that might be appealing to or for higher that, institutions. Or for that reason, it might be not appealing at all. Ah, you mean, but it's, well, they, they would have Frank Miller exhibited, um, who is very 
very interesting, and they, they probably would should, they should get interested in this insofar as that there is a cultural impact that they have already. So there is a need for that. The only question is, how do we fill the need? How do we answer the call? Which is? Right. Yeah, that's a great place to, to end this part of the conversation, which we'll pick up again over the next few days. Yeah, and one you. thing we didn't mention is that um, you probably noticed it in the program, but we've grouped the talks into kind of clusters, and then each of each speaker will have their own 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. And then at the end of these little groups, we're going to have panel discussions where we're going to give everyone more time to really think about the ideas that are coming out. We very much view you all as participants in this. You're not just passive viewers out there. Ooh, it's very, very thematic, isn't it? It's a game. It is what you're doing there. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Um, we're going to stay in your seat.